Welcome to First Baptist Church of Elkin, a community of faith that seeks to love, live, grow, and go like Jesus. Regardless of who you are or where you've been, everyone is welcome, really. If this is your first time with us, we feel honored that you would choose to worship here today. After the service, we would love to meet you out on the front lawn and answer any questions that you may have about the church. We would also like to extend a warm welcome to our Facebook viewers. Though we wish that you could be with us, we are so thankful that you could join us online. If this is your first time viewing the service, then please let us know in the comment section below. Here are a few things that you need to know this week. We will once again be collecting non-perishable food items for the Elkin City Schools Backpack Program throughout the month of January. Your donations go directly to students in need of food. Thank you so much for donating. On January the 22nd at 1115, I'll be hosting a baptism class for children and students who are curious about what it means to follow Jesus and why we are submerged in the waters of baptism. This class is great for those who have had questions about baptism or faith or for students who have recently made a decision to follow Jesus but aren't sure what comes next. A parent or guardian is required to attend this class with the child or the student and lunch will be provided. You can RSVP with me as soon as possible. The Missions Council is sponsoring a Red Cross blood drive on February the 5th from 1 to 5.30. You can schedule your appointment to donate by going to redcrossblood.org or contacting Gene Lyles at 336-325-6640. Please encourage those you know to sign up and donate blood as well. One of our greatest ministries to the community is our Play School program. We serve over 50 children each week and it offers families much needed support. Speaking of support, we've become aware of a need that you may be able to help us with. The Play School is in need of dedicated volunteers and substitutes that Pat can call on when our teachers are out due to vacations or illness. We're searching for individuals who enjoy working with children as well as can lift children with ease. If this sounds like an opportunity that you would like to explore further, then please email me at justin at elkinfbc.com and I will forward that request to our advisory committee. This is an urgent need and your inquiries are greatly appreciated. If you have an announcement that needs to be shared in next week's Need to Know, then please email me by Tuesday of this week. God bless and welcome to worship.
Let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord God, we come together this morning to worship you. As we slowly make our way through the first month of a brand new year, we are met head on with new challenges, new disappointments and frustrations, new victories and encouragements. We are slowly moving away from the thrill of hope that Christmas offers and towards the sackcloth and ashes of Lent. And this in-between period that we find ourselves in really represents where most of us find ourselves spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. So help us, God, to find you and celebrate you in the ordinary. Help us feel your presence in the mundane, because we can't just find you in the manger or on the cross. You walk with us in daily life, and we are thankful to have a friend like you. We offer our lives to you, Jesus, trusting you are with us and for us. In Christ's name, amen. Please join me in the responsive reading. Holy One, we are constantly bombarded with temptations and enticements. When we yield, when we fail, you will help us. You, Lord, have come to our aid. You teach us, counsel us, and guide us in the ways that you should go. We rejoice in your unfailing love. Amen. Amen. Please stand now if you're able and join us in our call to worship. Come thou fount of every blessing. Number 15. If the children would like to come down for kids' time, we invite them to come down now. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Hi. I think we've got one more coming down. All right, hey. So this morning, let's pretend for a second that I made a promise. And the promise that I made was that for the entire month of January, I was not going to eat any chocolate. That's a pretty hard promise to make, right? So let's say that one day I needed to go to the grocery store to pick up a few things. 
And while I was shopping and looking for all the groceries that I needed, I went to the checkout line and I saw this. Super King Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Reese's are my favorite candy ever. So, it would be really hard for me to keep my promise if I pass by these Reese's. You don't like Reese's Cups? No, What's your? They're nasty. They're nasty? <laughs> well, to each his own, I guess, because I, I love these things, Lizzie. So, let's say that I, I pass by these, and then I had a big decision to make. I could either decide, okay, am I going to keep my promise and not eat chocolate the entire month of January and just look away, or am I going to buy the Reese's Cups because I really want them and eat them? What, do you, what should I do? Buy them? Buy yeah. <laughs> I think I, I'm on the same page with you for sure. Don't buy them because they're nasty. Okay, that, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. You don't like them either? Oh, no, there's a whole revolt happening about Reese's Cups. Okay. You do? Me too. Okay, so I should probably say no because I made a promise, right? I made a promise that I wasn't going to eat chocolate. So I should probably leave these to the side and move away and keep going um, and, and choose something different that maybe isn't chocolate. Uh, so when we desire something that we shouldn't have, or we want something that isn't good for us, do we know what that's called? It starts with a T. Uh, yes, a temptation. So a temptation is when we desire something or we want something that we probably shouldn't have or maybe isn't good for us. And we all have temptations, right? We all go through things and maybe are tempted. And a temptation can be something really minor and not that big of a deal, like seeing chocolate in the grocery store after I said I wasn't going to eat it. Or it might be something major, a really big deal, like maybe you didn't study for a test and you might be tempted to look at the person sitting beside you. Um, that's, that's a bigger deal, isn't it? So everybody has temptations, and the Bible even says in Hebrews 4.15, Jesus faced all the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. So what's so great about that um, is that we know that Jesus was tempted too, but he chose not to do the wrong thing. He always chose to do what was good and what was right. And so if he chose not to do the wrong thing, then that means that Jesus can help us to not do the wrong thing too. Jesus can help us fight against our temptations. And one way that Jesus would fight temptation was by memorizing scripture. He held on to all the promises that God made in the Bible. And so one time, Jesus was fasting. Have you ever heard that word before? Fasting means you don't eat food for a period of time so that you can focus on God. So that's what Jesus was doing. He wasn't eating anything, but then he got really hungry. He was hungry, and he got tempted to eat some bread. But you know what he did? He read a scripture that he remembered, and that scripture said, People will not live on bread by itself, but on every word that comes from God. So that scripture helped him remember not to give into temptation. So this week, what I want you to do is challenge yourself to memorize Hebrews 4.15. Jesus faced all the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. And I hope that that will help you stay strong too the next time that you're tempted with something. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for being with us and walking beside us and um, sympathizing with what it means to be human and, and helping us be better humans. So God, I pray that this week that you would help us to fight temptation and to um, hang on and claim the promises that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If you are six years old or older, you can go back to your seat. And if you are five or younger, you can go to the nursery. Please stand and join me in our hymn of praise, We Walk by Faith.
Please join me in prayer. Lord, we know this life is full of wilderness. At some point in life, we will go through one. Lord, we pray that when we go through any situation that is in the form of wilderness, that you never leave us alone. Go with us and let your light shine on our path so we can see the way and never be lost. May those who are experiencing heartache be comforted by your spirit, strengthened by your love, and filled with a peace that surpasses all understanding. We ask for those in need, in want, in despair, for those needs known and unknown. We ask that you would move in mighty ways. We ask that your presence and your light would shine forth in the frigid fog fogginess of our lives and that you would bring discernment and clarity to our situations. We ask that the spirit of rejoicing would bless our lives, our hearts, that we would continue to shout praises, sing alleluia, and proclaim you as our light and guide, even in the wilderness. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus, now and forevermore with us, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
I just want to let you know that a lot of people have asked me about how my back is doing. It is so much better. I started physical therapy this week, and I can feel the strength in my legs and back coming back. So thank you for all the prayers and thoughts that y'all were, were giving me. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you so much for our freedom that we have to come and praise your name. Thank you so much for all the many blessings that you give to us that we so often take for granted. Lord, thank you so much for our church family and our staff and what they mean to us. We, we pray that your help will be with us as we know it will, as we try to reach out in our community and the world to teach others about your son. Lord, thank you so much that you brought Mark back to us safely and we pray that you'll be with him and guide him as he is our shepherd one other thing of thanksgiving lord we want to thank you that through the generosity of all the ma members of the church family that we were able to raise the money to cover our budget last year lord we pray that you'll be with us and help us as we go forward with all the new challenges that we face, that we'll continue to praise your name and open our hearts and our wallets to do your work. Lord, we pray this all in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Good morning. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted there by Satan. For 40 days and 40 nights he ate nothing and became very hungry. Then Satan tempted him to get food by changing stones into loaves of bread. It will prove you are the Son of God, he said. But Jesus told him, No, for the scripture tells us that bread won't feed men's souls. Obedience to every word of God is what we need. Then Satan took him to Jerusalem to the roof of the temple. Jump off, he said, and prove you are the Son of God. For the scriptures declare, God will send his angels to keep you from harm. They will prevent you from smashing on the rocks below. Jesus retorted, it also says not to put the Lord your God to a foolish test. Next, Satan took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him the nations of the world and all their glory. I'll give it all to you, he said, if you will only kneel and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. The scriptures say, worship only the Lord God, obey only him. Then Satan went away, and the angels came and cared for Jesus. The words of God for the people of God. Thank you, Kathy. So good to see you all today. Seems like the month of January has come with lots of, lots of sickness, and, uh, and today many of us are here, and it's just worshipful to be in one another's presence, isn't it? What a beautiful story we get to reflect on uh, today, and this morning's gospel lesson really needs no introduction, does it? You, you, may, not, you may not be able to remember all three of the temptations that Jesus was confronted with, if someone were to ask you about this story or the details that are unique to each gospel, but this is a familiar story for us because all of us, at some point or another, has come face to face with the devil in the wilderness of temptation. Now, opinions about devils and angels abound, don't they? And perhaps you can't get on board with the literal figure of the devil. And if that's you, then I have good news for you, that's me too. But if you struggle with the literal figure of the devil that we might see in cartoons, just remove the D. And what do you have? Evil. Evil is real, isn't it? And I think today's lesson seeks to make that abundantly clear for us. So... Now, the lectionary actually skips over this, this passage in Matthew's sequence, saving it for Lent, but, but I think it's, it's best proclaimed right here in the order that is, is in in the gospel because last week we, we joined Jesus, if you recall, in the waters of baptism. And in today's story, Jesus is still dripping wet from his baptism as he is led out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness is a very important detail in Matthew's Gospel because the boy that Herod tried to kill is now coming face to face with evil once again. So we see Jesus in the Gospel being born into a world where evil is present. And then evil seems to confront Jesus at every turn just as it does us. And this story reveals how Jesus is going to respond to evil as the gospel story continues to unfold. Now let me quickly state the obvious. You and I are not Jesus. Uh, but of course, the, the term uh, Christian means little Christ. And as, as followers of Jesus, it is our desire to, to love and to live and to grow and to go like Jesus. This is our church's mission statement. So, so you and I are not going to bat a thousand uh, in the wilderness of life, as Jesus does in this story. But if we do not believe that we are capable of following Jesus and making the right choices, as Justin shared and challenged us so well in the, in the children's sermon, then our church mission statement isn't worth the paper that it's printed on, right? And so today, sometimes I think we just need a sermon that says we can. And this is a story in the gospel text that says that we can, through and by the power of the Holy Spirit, be obedient to Christ. If we're to be like Jesus, then we too must rely 
not on our physical strength. And that's what this lesson seeks to articulate because Jesus has no physical strength left by the time he's confronted by the devil. But we must rely on our spiritual strength. And spiritual strength comes from God, which is why we read these stories over and over again and we internalize their, their, their meaning and inspiration and we ask God to help us to resist evil and to live into who and into what that God has created us to be. So the choice that Jesus makes in the wilderness is faithfulness. And Jesus was not a robot. He was one of us. And this, this devil figure is not a horned cartoon figure either. This represents evil. Jesus came to live in a world where evil is present. And the big theological canvas that Matthew wants to paint is about the faithfulness of God under pressure in human flesh. Now these temptations that we find in today's text are not everyday temptations. Nobody has ever come to me and said, Pastor, why don't you turn these stones into bread? Or just get up on the steeple and just jump off toward Gwen Avenue and if you land on your feet, I'll join the church this Sunday morning. But these temptations actually mirror the temptations that, that Israel experienced in the wilderness. They were, they were no different than their theological ancestors, Adam and Eve, as the Israelites were confronted with, with evil. And of course, Adam and Eve represent each one of us who came from the dust of the earth. See, the Israelites were on a journey to the promised land and they were confronted with temptation. Adam and Eve were literally born with, in paradise with silver spoons in their mouths, we might say. But there was one tree, just one, that they were told not to eat from. They could sit under the tree and they could enjoy its shade. They could take a step back and they could look upon the tree and they could, they could enjoy and admire its beauty. But they were not to eat its fruit. And this was surely a beautiful tree. We've kind of demonized the tree, haven't we, because of its role in the, in the, uh, the theological story of the Bible. But, uh, but it was surely a beautiful tree in the garden. But the devil uses it to exploit God's people and to exploit God's purposes. The serpent said, eat this fruit, you'll be like God. Do you see what's happening in, in that story? And we'll connect them. The, 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 the serpent created this narrative this isn't God's narrative. The serpent didn't have the authority to tell Adam and Eve that they would be made like God. And evil, you see, always comes to us on its own terms, exploiting the resources that God has given us and compelling us to use those good resources for our own gain. You may have heard ministers often say things like, this old world, as if this earth in which we live is just some garbage dump. And we're all just passing through it, trying to get to the next life. But you see, this world is a beautiful world. But its beauty is so often usurped and abused and perverted by evil. You see, God didn't create garbage when God made each one of us. We are beautifully and we are wonderfully made. And the earth and all that is in it is, is wonderfully and beautifully made, just like Adam and Eve, those theological figures, the garden in that theological story, it was useful and it was beautiful. It was a real sight to behold. So, Pastor, what's wrong with the world? Well, the powers and principalities of darkness prey on all that God intended to be good. And we as God's people often say yes when we should say no. And we all have a tendency to say no when we probably should say yes. Notice that in that first temptation, Jesus isn't offered a strong drink or a hit of some drug that'll carry him away into some kind of ecstasy. That's not the temptation that we see here. The devil simply asked Jesus to turn the stones into bread. I mean, this is the devil, right? The worst of the worst. And all he wants Jesus to do is make a little bit of bread. What's so bad about bread? Because soon enough, Jesus is going to do this, right? He's going to multiply the loaves and the fish anyway. So what's so bad about this request? I mean, some of you know me. I'm a pretty competitive guy. And I feel as though Jesus should just show him who's boss. If we're going to set the stage for your ministry, Jesus, 
Why don't you just go ahead and reveal the power of your baptism? This is precisely one of the challenges that you probably should accept. But Jesus says no. And why does Jesus say no? Because to say yes would have been a perversion of his power. To say yes would have been to take the stone and transform the stone into something that it was never intended to be. To say yes would have been to use the power that God had placed within him to appease the devil. And to say yes would be to elevate himself from the place of human and deny his mission and humanity with us. But you see, ultimately saying yes to the devil in this story would be saying no to God. And the way the story unfolds seeks to illustrate that because we have two temptations, but what is the third one? Just go ahead and worship me, right? And that's what it was about all along. Do you see what Jesus and Matthew trying to teach us? That there are all kinds of things in the garden of this world that we need and that God has given us. Like bread, for instance. Does anybody else love bread as much as me and my one-and-a-half-year-old little girl? Oh, we could just eat bread all day long, and every morning Katie says, one piece of toast, you know, just one. But I try to eat the whole grain stuff because it's better for my belt line. Physical intimacy. Uh, I chose that very carefully to save you some difficult conversations with your children later. Is a gift from God and empowers intimacy and connection with the person that we've promised ourselves to for all of life. Wine. In moderation, is good for your heart. Pills will numb your pain in the aftermath of invasive surgery. Science and technology are gifts from God. Money, it's a gift from God that allows us to bless the church and provide for our families and bless others. Our earth is filled with beautiful, wonderful natural resources that are to be utilized and they make our lives more efficient and help us be more effective. And I could go on and on about how beautiful how pleasant and how resourceful this world is and, and, and us as individuals. But there is a force at work in the world that preys on the beauty of God's creation. Most namely, it preys on each of us as human beings. May we consider today all the many ways that we exploit the good things that God has given to us. This is the weekend when we celebrate the birthday of Martin Luther King, Jr., and we remember the struggle for civil rights. You know, God made us beautiful. God made us to be colorful, right? But look at how we took something as simple and beautiful as color. And we used it to prop up one race over another. God says be physically intimate with your spouse. And human beings determine that they're going to be physically intimate with whoever they want. God says that wine is a gift from God and humans drink it until they destroy their bodies. God gives us the gift of a light bulb and we develop atomic bombs capable of destroying the entire earth. God gives us medicine and, 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 and we, we abuse it. God gives us money. And instead of using 90% to support our families and prepare ourselves for old age while giving 10% or more back to charity, so many Americans spend 100%, 110% of it and die in debt, never having given anything to charity and nothing to leave our children. God gives us a pizza, and if you're like me, you eat the whole thing. Why do we do that? God grants us leadership positions to propel the church forward, and so many churches are, are broken because of, of disputes among God's own people who oftentimes think it's more important to be right than righteous. It happens all the time in so many places. So the devil came to give Jesus this very subtle temptation. Take these stones and turn them into bread and I will worship you. Jesus said no because the Son of God didn't come to be a magician and because that wasn't the purpose of those stones nor was this the, pur the purpose of bread. Jesus will not take that which is God's and give it to the devil. Do you remember the Israelites when they were given daily manna and quail in the wilderness? They were told not to keep any of it until the, uh, at the day's end, but they were told to trust God until their next meal. But what did they do? They took what God had given them, they filled up their baskets, and they hoarded the bread inside their tent. Theft and dishonesty and greed, they took the gifts of God and hoarded those gifts and resources for their own personal gain, which ultimately led 
to their destruction. Do you remember when God delivered the Israelites from bondage in Egypt? And on the way out, they took gold and jewelry, which was supposed to be a reminder that God brought them out of slavery. But what did they do with the beautiful gift that God gave them? They took the gifts of God, melted them down, created a golden calf, and worshipped it. Do you see a trend here from the very beginning of Scripture in Genesis? Perversion and exploitation of the good gifts that God had given to them. But Jesus is led out into the wilderness to model a different way for us. Jesus is God in the flesh, the incarnation, but he wasn't about to exploit his divinity because he came to share in our humanity. So let me ask you today, how do the evil powers of this world seek to exploit you? How do the evil powers in this world seek to exploit your family? How do the evil powers of the world seek to exploit the church? Jesus went into the wilderness led by the Spirit to reveal to us that God can be trusted under pressure. The pressure that Jesus was under is emphasized in this story, both by the duration of time that he spent in the wilderness, some 40 years, uh, and also by the fact that he was hungry. He was famished, the gospel writer tells us. He was run down. He was depleted of energy and nutrition. Life has taught us all that we are the most vulnerable when, when we are fatigued, just like our muscles when you've been you know, riding, the, uh, riding the indoor studio cycle for an hour and you get off and you can't feel your legs. When life leaves us anxious, fatigued, and exhausted, we're often more prone to failure. And, and this is when the devil comes to Jesus at this, at this peak moment when he uh, has the potential for failure. But our character in life is ultimately revealed in moments just like this. So, so what can we do as God's people when we know that we live in a world where there is so much evil and where temptation confronts us at every turn? I'll offer what I think is some very practical wisdom. The first thing I think we can do is, is just practice saying no. That sounds really elementary, doesn't it? But we live in a world that invites us to say yes to everything, and we find ourselves saying yes when God tells us to say no. So, so practice simply saying no. I was counseling a person once upon a time who told me that he had done X, Y, Z and had been dealing with this particular issue for years and years and years, and he had seen this person and that person and read this book and that book, and nothing seemed to be working. And I just asked him, well, have you ever, have you ever just tried saying no? It sounds elementary, but you know what he said to me? No. Consider those subtle areas in your life where you seem to be saying yes to conversations and people and obligations where you should just be saying no. Say no to that extra job that will ruin time with your family or that extra meeting that you just don't have time for because that's family time. Say no to that new car if it will stress you out and rob you of your ability to be generous in other areas of your lives. Don't respond to that text if you know that nothing good can come from it. Let that email sit until tomorrow morning because you're just too mad to respond. You know, I think the evil powers work in the world, the many ways in which it comes to us, tells us that taking care of ourselves is all about saying yes to whatever will bring us immediate gratification. But taking care of ourselves is, is more about saying no to all those things that seek to exploit our gifts and our charisma and our resources and our money. I think self-care is one of the most misunderstood concepts in our lives. You might say, well, Pastor Jesus didn't say, if anyone wants to be my disciple, let them uh, take care of themselves. That's not what Jesus said. He said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. But you see, following Jesus is the best care that we can offer ourselves in this life because it always leads us to deeper places of joy and satisfaction and contentment. You know, Jesus was really big on self-care. I know he tells us all about self-denial, but Jesus was really big on self-care. Jesus rested on the Sabbath, didn't he? And the only time he didn't is when his neighbor was in need. 
Jesus spent significant time, especially if you read the Gospel of Luke, but, but we find Jesus in the Gospels. He spends significant time by himself in prayer and, and reflection because he knew that he needed it. Jesus was a student of the Scriptures. He had filled his heart and mind with the teachings of God, quoting again three different passages in this story alone. Jesus spent a lot of time with his friends, his disciples, we find him surrounded by crowds, but how much time do we find Jesus spending with those who were closest to him, his disciples? He took care of himself mentally and socially and emotionally and spiritually. Not only that, but what happened right before this story? Jesus was baptized, and baptism is a commitment. Jesus made a commitment. Jesus has a plan when he goes into the wilderness, now, we all know about planning for the worst. Does anybody here plan for the worst? We, we all do that. Uh, you know, you all have health insurance, don't you? Many of you have life insurance. Uh, my family, we're going on a family cruise uh, to make up for missed time together while I was gone and when I'm going to be gone again and when they tell me where the muster station is. I'm going to pay attention because I watched Titanic many, many times and I know that it can happen to me. But I guarantee you that half the ship won't know where the muster stations are because they assume that it won't happen to us. The question is never, will evil and misplaced passion come our way? The question is always when. So how will we respond? You see, I love this story because Jesus had already made up his mind in advance of the wilderness and he knew that he was not going to take his cues from anyone except God. He was frail and weak and fatigued, but, but Jesus offers a scriptural response and he was not going to be left saying that the devil made me do it. If Jesus sounds rehearsed in today's story, it's because he is. He had a plan, and he had responses. In our own lives, we must decide that we're not going to take our cues from the world, but that we're going to take our cues from God alone. And later on in Jesus' ministry, we'll hear this and witness this theme playing itself out again and again. Three different times we hear, if you are the Son of the God, if you are the Son of God, and when Jesus was on the cross, the chief priest said, if he is the Son of God, let him come down from there. The temptation, and Jesus could have no doubt, but he didn't. And the reason he didn't is because the demands of him were coming from the wrong source. Even Peter told Jesus, there is no need for you to suffer and die. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. You see, Jesus is fulfilling all righteousness throughout the Gospels by living into who he said he was, into who God created him to be, and into who and what God has called each of us to be. And that is faithful. And then I would say the other thing that got Jesus through the wilderness, and this is what gets us through the wilderness of this life as well. It's the message of Christmas that comes to us again just a few weeks into Epiphany. You see, Jesus knew that he was not alone. He remembered when God named him and claimed him in the waters of baptism. Look what happens in the story. After this tidal wave of pain and temptation went back out to sea, what do we witness? We witness the angels tending to Jesus. They fed Jesus. They nurtured Jesus. Jesus knew that they were there to pick him up. And Jesus knew that the Spirit was with him because we learn in the story that the Spirit led him and the Spirit accompanied him. You know those angels come to us in all kinds of ways in life, don't they? assuring us that we are not alone in the wilderness. And those angels bring us through the wilderness. And in this beautiful story, it is the angels that receive Jesus after the 40 days are over. David Luce writes that, might it be that part of being human is being aware that we are insufficient, that we are not complete in and of ourselves, that lack is a permanent part of our condition. To be human, in other words, he writes, is to be aware that we carry inside ourselves a hole, an emptiness that we will always be restless to feel. Yet that isn't quite the full picture, he writes. 
Rather, to be human is to accept that we are finally created for relationship with God and with each other. So perhaps the goal of life, the goal of the life of faith, isn't to escape limitation, but to discover God amidst our needs and learn that God's grace is sufficient for us no matter where we find ourselves or what we find ourselves going through. You see, in this story, Jesus doesn't come through in the Scripture through spectacular tricks, but rather what we discover is a dependable God who can be trusted. You know, I'll never stop praying for miracles. I've seen a lot of miracles in life. I've, I've, I, I know that I've witnessed miracles, things that belong in that category. But first and foremost, it is my prayer that, that each of us will receive the miraculous strength and steadfast love of Jesus that can be trusted under pressure. That each of us will find a stable place to stand in hardships and trust God enough not to take our cues from the world. You know, this wasn't the last wilderness for Jesus. In fact, this is the first wilderness of many. Jesus will spend the next three years of his life, the duration of his public ministry, in a wilderness of temptation. Temptation to, to quit, temptation to go another way, a temptation to bow down to the powers and principalities of darkness and the empire of this world. But that's not the witness of Jesus. So let me ask you today, are you in a wilderness? Are you feeling famished today? Not just hungry for food, but hungry for strength, and for sustenance, and for power from God. The good news of the gospel and the good news of this story is that the angels are waiting for you on the other side. Which leads me to believe the angels accompany you in the midst of whatever it is that you're going through in your life right now. Look around for those angels, and you'll find them. You'll find them in your friends. You'll find them in your family. You'll find them in your church. You'll find them in all that God created and called good. Hold fast to the promise. Know that even in the dark tomb of your situation, Emmanuel, God again, God with us. God is with you, and God is doing a new thing in, our, in your life. Uh, just as God was doing a new thing in Jesus, and Jesus was famished and didn't realize all the beautiful things that were about to happen when the angels would greet him and he would go on to, to live this beautiful, wonderful life of faith that inspires us to this very day. You may have heard the story of the man who said, I'm going through hell. And his not-so-sensitive buddy said, Well, that's no place to stop. A variation of that quote was attributed to Churchill, some of you know. And Rodney Atkins wrote a country song about it. And I'm still going to do that gospel and country music series one of these days. But the witness of Jesus reveals that the Spirit accompanies us in the wilderness and will guide us out of the wilderness, whatever the wilderness may be. And the character of Jesus reveals that victory in the wilderness is not achieved through miracles and magic tricks, but through steadfast devotion to God that can sustain us under pressure. So church, say no to this world and say yes to God. Today, life may be going so well for you and you're thinking to yourself, why did I have to hear this sermon today about temptation and sin and everything that's wrong with the world? Well, if that's you, just put this sermon in your back pocket. Uh, you'll need it, not if, but when. You yourself come face to face with the devil. But if life has left you famished and hungry, may Christ renew your strength today. May Christ give you the strength that you need for this week that is to come. If Lance comes to lead us in our hymn of response, I invite you to respond to today's service as the Holy Spirit leaves. If you've never given your life to Christ and you feel as though you're walking through this life alone, may today be the day that you profess your faith in Christ. Today, if you're walking alone as a Christian and you want to unite with us in this church and become a member, this is the moment in the service where we give you that opportunity to, to share that with us. Next Sunday morning, we have a baby dedication. We have a baptism service plan. Uh, you may have been a Christian for a long time, but you might say, Pastor Mark, I've just never been baptized today. 
Uh, and we're going to fill the baptistry up next week, and we'd love for you to be a part of that service if the Holy Spirit leads. Let's stand to our feet and lift our voices together in song. M613. Thank you for your presence in this time of worship today here at First Baptist Elk. And I want to offer a, a word of gratitude to all of you that have contributed to our technology AV upgrade. Um, as you can see, we're 50% of the way there uh, with the screens. Uh, we do hope that everything will be fully operational by the end of, by the end of January. So um, the other screen will, will be operational, and the screen in the back, and the sound system is still not hooked up. Things sounded great today, thanks to the, to the AV team up in the balcony, but we do hope by the end of the month all of that will be fully operational. So uh, many of you have given uh, one-time gifts. Many of you have made this uh, just a point of generosity for you over an extended period of time, and so we're glad to see the fruits of, uh, of your generosity and the labor of so many people that have made this a reality. I also want to encourage you um, as we celebrate the birthday of a great Baptist preacher, um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., um, there will be a service this afternoon at 3 o'clock uh, at New Beginnings uh, Methodist Church in Jonesville, just across the river. A number of clergy from the community will be participating in that service. So go grab some lunch, and uh, if you're able, come be with us at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Let's bow our heads. I'll offer you this benediction. So go now, church, into the wilderness of this world to live into the miracle of God's love and the supernatural power of God's presence. Go knowing that Christ has been where you are, that Christ is with you wherever you are, and that by saying yes to Christ and no to the world, you will be sustained in your coming and in your going to be light in the darkness this day and forevermore. Amen.